all professional prospects that will be coming? How would you identify these players? Is their goal to come to Peoria to, to be seen by the MLS, or what's that pool of players like? Yeah, I'll just give my brief two cents and give it to Tim because uh, Tim actually played in this league. So Tim is a, a product of this environment where he was a college player, he played in this same league, and then got drafted and went on to play professionally. But I think Tim would be the first to tell you, just like any other sport, you know, how many of them are going to go pro? Small. Uh, but I think it, it's a place for them to, to do as Tim mentioned. A lot of them are looking to combine this with an experience, and their coaches want them out around the country getting an experience and doing it. So, uh, look, to, to be fair, we're going to try to target as many of the best players as we can that we know through our network and bring them here. Um, but it is, Path to Pro is not just a tagline. The, the history shows that this is where the top MLS college kids are going to come from, and it also shows some of these kids will get signed overseas, and many of them will represent our national team in, in World Cup qualification, and, and hopefully, um, if we can mirror what the women are doing back into the World Cup. Yeah, and, and so when it comes down to the players that are going to go pro, as was mentioned, uh, the number is not going to be huge. But if you look at the MLS draft and players that go from college into the MLS, around 80% play in this league at some point during their college career. So it's a pretty good number of players. And the players I've spoken to already, they have this level of ambition, and they think this is a pivotal part of it. As was mentioned, I had four seasons in this league before each one of my college seasons, freshman through senior. And I think it contributed to just additional experience and games played, which is valuable as the college season is a little bit of a sprint, and you have your spring, which is a really good development period, and this just adds another level onto that for the athletes. So you mentioned uh, overage players. What, what percentage do you think will be college players who, who will then go on and play the next fall or the fall after the season? I would say the, the vast majority would be college, current college okay. athletes. So going into their freshman year or going into their senior year, somewhere in that four-year window, okay. uh, at least 75%. Okay. It's going to be a strong number, if not probably even higher. It's the prime age. It's the prime people that, that want to make the effort to travel here and to live here and to kind of go out of their world right now, try a new venture in a new place. And so that's the energy you're getting from the age group. Yeah. I think one other thing that's important to that is we talked about this, and, and Kim's a big, we, we want to be Peoria destination. So you just can't tell really good soccer players to announce, hey, come to Peoria, oh, by the way, you're going to play in a nice field and you have a chance to be seen. Well, most of these kids have ambitions outside of soccer, too. So we're, we're really looking forward to that Peoria is a place for them to, to do a lot of other things that are going to make them more marketable, um, get them involved, in, and as we said, in community service and philanthropy and internship opportunities and job shadows. and. And I do think that is important to a lot of college kids. So if they could combine that with, with a great playing experience, that's, that's great. Tim, did you play on four different teams? Did you, will kids come back year after year, Peoria? Or? The, the goal was to keep them coming back. And uh, I played with the same organization. They did change names partway through. Uh, but it was the same group all the way. And, and I think that's fairly normal. And you'll find if they have a good experience, they're going to come back for more. Did you, you have any fans having Bradley players? And is there any geography base we have the only kids by, by geographical rule, or that's all recruiting? Uh, there's no limitation uh, geographically. Um, college kids, their NCAA does have rules, so we cannot have Bradley University players participate. Um, and, and by the same token, we describe people coming here. We also look at our Bradley players going elsewhere for different experiences and different coaches to be important. And so they're, they're, that is the only limitation we have. Everything else, uh, there are some. I'm going to bore you with all the details of how player rosters are built, but there are international transfer rules and things like that that are that are more detail centric. But uh, the, the, most of the players will still come throughout the U.S. college network. Matt, for any three of you, what, what is it? What's special about Central Illinois in, in terms of soccer? What is it about you know this area that you think okay, we can have this team here during the summer? It's going to make it successful with this demographic, the soccer players. I mean, what makes it so special? Well, it's a soccer town, and it's become that over the last 45 years. It wasn't that before. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think I, my first soccer game was at um, um, McMurray College. And it was like, what's that? And now you have all these kids that are born and raised on it. It's uh, constantly fed by ESPN. You have the MLS on TV. Kids are, they have fantasy teams. They're into this, and if time is right, because they don't have a team to follow, they may follow Chicago Fire or somebody like that, maybe somebody in St. Louis, but they have a local team where hopefully some of our collegiate players or 
staying and having a following like uh, like Ken did, I mean, it's going to be a real draw, and the kids will look up and say, I, I want to do that. So, you know, I was just going to mention who our opponents are here. We have Des Moines, Menace, Caw Valley Football Club, which is Lawrence, Kansas, Chicago Football United, Green Bay Voyagers, um, St. Louis Lions, FC Manitoba, and the Thunder Bay Chill. So the reach of this Peoria team through this Midwest up into Canada, through these northern cities, I think is going to put us on the map in, in one more unique way and uh, really help the community. I think you mentioned the area. Peoria um, was very uh, attractive as we decided, you know, to be fair, we were quartered by two or three different leagues that wanted it. And Peoria was probably one of the last of our size cities to, to bring this on board. So some of the other cities are the, the league above us, the professional league. So we do it, and, and, and as Tim was mentioning, you know, if you, if you follow it, right now the, you know, the NBA basketball and soccer between the 18 and 25 demographic is of the tops in the country. And if you walk around any college campus or any high school campus, it's gonna be filled with jerseys and, and people who know who these people are on both the, the men's and women's side. So we, we think we've got a, a right place for a good foothold. To follow up on that, just you mentioned high school, so yeah. what is the age kind of bracket? I mean, is high school or high school yes. that you're looking at that too? Yeah, high, high school players come in, you know, let, let's be fair, they're, they're going to try to compete against sometimes, you know, 21, 22, right. 23. I think the league does a good job of, of asking you to help develop local talent. And so I think Tim will, will, will uh, work well within that framework to try to give some kids an opportunity to train uh, in hopes that if they go away to school, they come back, this is a good place for them. And um, it, it, the, the league really encourages that. They want younger players to be involved, even if it's just in a training capacity and, and maybe get a match here and there. But uh, we certainly are excited about you know working with the league, and that, that's a goal of ours. Is there an attendance goal? Is there going to be considered a good crowd? Do you have a business plan goal? It, it's wild. So you know, I think what we're doing and why we're involved in it is we're looking for something unique. Many of the teams that play in this, they don't have any marketing or promotions, they don't charge gate. It, it just, a game happens on an arbitrary Saturday night and outside of maybe a family member or two, there, there's nothing. It's just uh, a lot of the ownership groups are, we want to win, can we get a trophy? You know, can I feel good about it? Uh, that's never been our mission. Again, we, we talk about, we're looking for fan engagement, we want people there, we want it in an affordable manner, but uh, I think You'll see by us uh, attendance is um, is a, a prime you know factor in what we want to get accomplished. I couldn't give you a number because the number is from zero in the league uh, to you know fifteen hundred two thousand a game. So I, I think we're uh, we know what we know what we want to try to do. Tim, can you talk a little bit about the greater economic impact the league will have for the Peoria area? Yeah, I do. You know. Right now, um, uh, St. Francis is trying to recruit in about 120 uh, cancer surgeons for the cancer center. And this is one more piece in the recruiting tool that we have in our arsenal that are attracting people into the city. And um, I think we're going to be successful. A lot of the things that we're doing globally uh, here in the Heights and in Peoria are getting people excited about where this city is headed, where this region is headed. Uh, you know, San Cody Lakes over in Spring Bay is a hunting and fishing destination now. And I think you like to fish, you want to get out there today, right? It's yes. a little cold, but <laughs> these things all fit the fabric of a uh, place that people are going to want to move into and live. These are high paying jobs. The economic impact is going to be wider and greater than just uh, a soccer club, but it's all part of turning the tide and uh, going on an upward uh, trajectory. Yeah, I think also, too, as people come to Peoria throughout the summer for other events, <clears throat> having opportunities after a tournament or after you know going to the museum or doing these things on the riverfront to have something to offer them also you know, is, is important and i think that's where you will see it a little bit of course visiting teams are going to come in and have to use hotels and they're going to eat in the restaurants and they're going to be you know involved in the community but i do think it's this kind of secondary area of, of what else is available as they just look down on what's going on this weekend yeah, you start signing players immediately Saturday, do you think you will sign players Saturday? Uh, we will probably take another week or two, uh, but yes, we, we will start the process. We're pretty far along with quite a few guys in terms of communication. Uh, it'll be ongoing over the weeks and months, and we'll uh, try to get maybe one question answered. The, the roster size will be fairly large uh, for what a soccer team normally would be. It'll range in the 30 plus. Uh, and the reason is, is it's a lot of games. 
you don't want to push any one of them too much physically. So uh, it'll be a large group and it'll make for a really good training environment too. Any other questions? Craig, come on. Could you touch on uh, if any kind of relationship you guys would have with Bradley and the School of Sports Communication? Yeah, you know, certainly as you well know, one of the things that we'll always be looking for is, you know, we'll get more details out. We want to, as we talked about, the only thing amateur about this will be the players. And I think you can see already by the pieces put together and what we're doing here today is we hope to be very professional in nature. And, and one area of that is, is uh, for, for the common part, we hope to stream games and have opportunities for play-by-play -play and color. Uh, ha have people the opportunity to come and, and to, to get an experience and, and learn about uh, what it's like to take a game from start to finish in all the different areas. And as you know, there's, there's lots of different ways from marketing and social media and all these different opportunities. And we're going to be looking for, for people to do that. And again, uh, as, as Kim mentioned, especially for those students that stay in Peoria in the summer, uh, here's a great opportunity, as well as with our other sports franchises that go on uh, to, to use. Right. Have you worked with any um, streaming services or providers? Like yeah, you know, in the past, and, and Bobby can speak to this a little bit by, you know, obviously our Bradley uh, being from the Missouri Valley Conference, we have a tremendous amount of exposure through ESPN Plus and uh, virtually every one of the men's soccer games at Bradley University and most of our Olympic sports and, and of course, basketball is through those platforms or various <coughs> platforms. Um, the league itself actually does have its own video platform where people can sub subscribe to for free and then uh, all USL games uh, are broadcast through that should they choose. Tim? Yeah, so each level of the USL is different, but we will have access to, through the services of USL V2, uh, for the ability to stream, but we can uh, branch out if we prefer uh, to go with another example. Uh, you can put it on YouTube or anything you want to do. You're, you have a lot of freedom. Yeah, Tim, as someone who was in this league and obviously worked your way up, and now you're your coach, right? So. What's your excitement level? What's your pitch to players to come in? How do you kind of balance all that with your experience? Uh, well, I try to sell it first uh, because it is a process of selling. You want to get them to come here. There's options. There's over 80 teams this year in the league, uh, a lot of them with really long, deep roots. Uh, they've had great success and great coaches and great people. So uh, you don't want to act like you're the only one, but uh, try to sell them what we offer as a community, uh, the facilities we offer, and then from a coaching standpoint, uh, the ability to teach them and show them that the road to get to a professional environment is very difficult and uh, there are ups and downs and and kind of guide them through that and of course i i tell them every time i speak to a player uh, there's one thing i know best it's my own experience and so i can tell you that i can't tell you how yours is going to go but uh, i try to guide them down that field of uh, how challenging this whole thing could be but put yourself in a good place around good people and give yourself a better chance are, are there playoffs and playoffs you cover all these two teams or yeah, so the, the process is uh, there's uh, each conference. So we're in a division, we're in the Heartland Division. Uh, there are three divisions in our conference, uh, and so they will create a final four within the conference. So the three division winners, best second place team of the three divisions, uh, goes into the final four of our conference, and then the, there'll be four other ones. And then it'll be a semifinal in the whole league and a final. So two, two, two playoff weekends is essentially what it is. There'll be one champion for 82 teams? Correct. Good luck, man. Yeah, <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. Uh, the, the logo, the shield, uh, is a work in progress, or is it, how, how's that working? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, good to defer here, but I, I think we are, uh, we're excited to, one thing I'd like to talk, someone had asked me, why Peoria City, what's Peoria City about? And, uh, if you follow soccer, you know, you have Manchester City and some of these other ones, but, you know, without, you know, making it too dramatic, we really think it is about Peoria City. We, we think. That's what the whole idea of this is. That's the idea of, of what, what Kim has done across the city is, is to, we're gonna play in the city. You know, our, our field is gonna be there. Uh, we're gonna be spread from the heights down over everywhere around. We want Central Illinois to come and see it. But our home is gonna be Peoria City. And uh, what's really exciting about that is we're gonna have some fan engagement um, through our landing page, and, and you can read about that here, and get people's ideas on what the shooting should look like. And, you know, you know, we, we want our supporters group to happen organically. We want someone to take the lead with that, much like, you know, Section 8, which is kind of a fire. But we, we really are excited about that part, and uh, that's what's going to be fun with the release, the badge, the shield. The colors will primarily be red, black with, with some white. We think that is going to speak to kind of so some cool opportunities with, with our uniforms and, and, uh, and, and get the fan engagements in. Really important for us. Okay. Right here. Right here. 
uh, the Bradley administration to work with them at all, or is it kind of you just pay rent for Shea Stadium, or yeah. are they supporting you in any way? Yeah, the, the, these, it's a great question, and, and I think it's, it's a pretty separate venture, right? You know, Shea Stadium, if you think about it, you know, Renaissance Coliseum gets rented out for different events, um, and this is really a space where, in the summer, we, we really we have we have nothing at at, at it. And and Tim Shea couldn't be here today, but uh, if Tim was here today, he is so proud in his family of that venue. And you know, we, we host the uh, breast cancer awareness game. We do a triple header with three uh, high, or six high school uh, female girls programs that start in May. We do some games in the fall, but. You know, it's such a spectacular <clears throat> venue that it just seemed really logical to be able to, to use it during this time when nothing else is going on. And, and I think that's going to be our connection, really, uh, just to, to showcase it. Okay. Is there an opportunity for a big cup? Oh, okay. that, I well, no, you're, I'm going to give it to Tim. Yes, that there is. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's diff a little bit more difficult than it was, but I'll, but I'll let Tim talk about it. Uh, not in the first year, so it's all dependent on your results during the summer league. And that transfers to the next Open Cup. So the example right, would be yeah, so the team already for the next correct. Year. So 2020 performance will impact 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, the current teams within our the League Two uh, will kick off the Open Cup in the March 23rd, March 24th window. Uh, they will start the early, early rounds as it then escalates into May when the professional teams enter, and then so each round just keeps on going. Sure. So the answer is yes. There would be opportunity. Uh, it would take certain qualification through the 2020 season. For those not familiar with the Open Cup, it's one of the coolest things we do in soccer. If you envision another sport, there is an opportunity for this team to actually go and play against when David Beckham was here. You can actually come from the bottom as an amateur team and play against the top Major League Soccer franchise. And in fact, I think, Tim, when you played, you guys did advance all the way through with a bunch of college kids to play a full MLS team. And there's been some incredible stories, as you see overseas, of, of some of these amateur teams knocking off a pro team on a given Saturday. So it does do it, and, and to be honest with you, that's what a lot of owners get involved for, for that, for that kind of glory moment, and it's cool. It's always there, but it does, it, it's a tough road, but it's always there. Are there any aspirational cities that have, you know, this league or a league or two above that you guys admire or, or can, can uh, glean some uh, tips from or how they made a splash, like Madison, Wisconsin has, has really made a splash recently? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Tim speak about it because Tim, you know, was a coach at, uh, in over in Indianapolis uh, with Indy 11, and uh, he was part of it from an expansion team all the way through until he came here. Yeah, if you look at those markets, what they did a great job was, is, uh, as Kim explained earlier, the young people that have now had the game around them their whole lives, and it's, it's different than any generation before, where if you are in college right now, soccer's been on TV your whole life, and it wasn't on TV when I was growing up until I got past college. So. Uh, that creates a whole new environment. So Madison, Wisconsin averaged 4,500 fans a game in their first season, which would be the third division pro, uh, so one ahead of us as we're amateur. Uh, you've seen the same, as it mentioned, was at Indy 11 in Indianapolis. Uh, they averaged 10,000 fans for their first two seasons. So the energy's out there. Uh, those numbers are a bit high probably for our market, uh, but the idea that there are groups of people that would be really passionate about this sport and just love the, the game day experience that a soccer stadium offers that's different than any other sport. Any other questions from the group? Uh, for those that are interested, we can do uh, individual interviews if, if you want to talk to any of these three specifically. And again, I want to thank everybody for, for coming out this afternoon, for everybody here uh, at Bremer Center for their assistance with, with this event, and, and, uh, and Grindstone as well for all of your work uh, in helping put this together. Uh, as you may have seen, there is a reception this evening as well. We can, uh, once we're finished here, we want to head over to Poor Brothers. Everybody will be available over there as well, and we'll have a nice uh, welcome to uh, Peoria City uh, from, from everybody here in Peoria Heights and, and the city of Peoria. Thank you.